was what candle? Love. So that leaves one more candle. What was the first candle that was lit? Hope. Second? Peace. Third? Joy. Joy. Today? Love. Love. What's the fifth candle? Miss Bessie said it. Did somebody else say it? It's the Christ candle. You say, what's the Christ? Well, that's coming up next week. The Christ is the Messiah. He is the one that our hearts are longing for. He's the one that we're looking for. And that's what Jesus came to say. Look, I can give you all of these things that we're going to talk about in Advent. He can give us hope. He can give us peace. He can give us joy. He can give us love. But the thing that we're needing more than anything else is him. That's when you finally find all of those things. You find all of those things in him. What your heart is really looking for. So that will be next week. Lord willing, we'll be able to be here next Sunday. I was asking Sheila. She asked me to stop and pick her up. And she said that there's some question marks about what's going to be going on next week for the weather. So let me. It's going to be cold. And she said that there's a possibility maybe for some snow or something. So mm -hmm. I'll just make this kind of as an announcement. I maybe should have made it earlier. If there is a problem with, you know, us having to close the service or something, please feel free to, to call the church answer machine. Robin told me here about a week or so ago that the answer machine was still playing one, a message that I'd recorded earlier this year. Has it been two weeks, a week or so ago? And so I've updated the message, but... If we are having cancellation next week, I will come up here and record a different message so to let you know. But that will be our policy all through these winter months. If you ever have a question, I will try to put on the church answer machine that services have been canceled to let you know. All right? We clear on that? Okay. So Lord willing, next week we'll be here to, to preach a message about the Christ. What, what you and I really need is Christ. But today we're going to talk about the love that we all need. Um, do any of y'all feel unloved, Chuck? <laughs> when I'm behind the pulpit, do you still feel loved? <laughs> well, <laughs> he's, he's at his lips. He didn't want to answer that question. Um, we all need to be loved, don't we? I, I don't remember any details about it, but I know that when I was in college 40 years ago, had to take a psychology class and they said that they did some experiments on animals and it's terrible the things that they do to animals it was recently you know there was the thing about Fauci and what he did to the beagle pups I even read more disturbing things about what he did to cats recently um, but years ago and as a psychology class they, they talked about some monkeys that they deprived of their mother so that the monkeys never felt love. And it was just unbelievable the impact that love has upon us. And so today's message is, is going to talk about love. The, I wrote down some familiar passages of Scripture that the Bible talks about love. The first passage of Scripture that I want to talk about is that you and I need to rest in an awareness that God loves us. The passage of Scripture is John 3, 16. Do you need to look it up? Or would you like to say it together as a group? I'll get you started. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Excellent. I wonder if I could do that with a group of young people under age 20. I wonder if I can do it with them with the Lord's Prayer. I wonder if I can do it with the 23rd Psalm. And I'll just kind of throw this out as a word of encouragement to you. I know that sometimes people make fun of John 3.16 because it's just so familiar. But that is a great passage of Scripture. And I suppose, I don't want to overstate it, but I suppose if you were to ask me, press me on the issue, what verse of scripture is my favorite, it would probably be that. Why? Because that passage of scripture says <coughs> that God loves the world. 
I don't know if you and I ever really stop to think about the world from God's perspective. You know, it's interesting. We see everything on the outside. God sees what's going on on the inside. You folks sure look nice this morning. What did you look like two hours ago? <laughs> You clean up nice. <laughs> I'm only saying that we are not what we appear to be, are we? What do you look like when you wake up first thing in the morning? Should we dare? No, people say don't, don't do that. Should I do as a dare? Why don't we set a Sunday that you come? As we oftentimes sing at invitation time, just as I am, <laughs> without one plea, and let everybody see what we're really like. But you know what? That's not the ugliest part of us. The ugliest part of us is what's on the inside. Several years ago, and I don't even know the name, I'm not a movie buff at all, but there was a movie out and I don't even know who it was that was in it. But the whole theme of the movie was that people were allowed to hear or see what the other person was thinking. Let me ask you a question. We'd be in trouble. We'd be in trouble. We'd be in trouble. And the real reason I'm saying is that because, folks, when we come here to church, we see the nice outside. God sees the inside with all of its ugliness. Let me ask you a question. And I want to see a show of hands if you're able to lift your arm. How many of you people could have been arrested this past week for what you thought? <laughs> I, I, oh, Charlie, just you and me. Everybody else can go home. Try and I are the only two that need this message. Come on, people, be honest. And the Bible says that God, in spite of looking at that world with all of its ugliness, and again, God is not looking at the outside. All of us make a big fuss about how we look on the outside. Don't we, Chuck? We want to look our best. God says, it's not the outside that I'm so much worried about. It's what I see going on in your heart. And don't tell me that just because you think you're religious people, that you're above all that. I said this the other night at, at, at one of the Bible studies. Bill, Bill O'Reilly did a, a number of books you know, the killing of Lincoln, the killing of Patton, the killing of Jesus. And in the book, The Killing of Jesus, that's one of the questions that he asked. Who killed Jesus Christ? And he goes into it. Was it the Romans? Was it the Pharisees? Was it so on and so forth? You know, was it you and me? Well, here's what I say with regard to it. You know who it really was? This, what was that? Well, yes, it was all of us. We, of course, weren't there, but here's what I was going to say, with, and we are church people. It was the church people that killed Jesus. So the re reason I'm saying that is don't ever kid yourself and think that because you're a church person, you got your act together. I'll say from experience, church people are the most dangerous. It wasn't just with the killing of Jesus, but when you go back and you look at the prophets, whether you want to talk about the prophet Jeremiah, one of my favorites, it was the church people that he had to fear the most. You know what I'm saying? Man, Pastor Tim, you're really tough on us. I'm simply saying <clears throat> that none of us really understands how bad we are, but God does. And he still loves us. I probably don't need to tell the story. I've told you a couple times, but 
Franklin Graham back in the early 1990s came to Charleston and he did his first crusade, his first one he'd ever done. He did it there in Charleston. And I went to a event. It was a prayer event at noon. It was a luncheon. And there was a bunch of ministers and whatnot to participate in the crusade. And I just sat down at a table and lo and behold, Franklin came and sat down at the table directly across from me. And I was looking for another place to go because I didn't feel like I should be sitting there across from him. But that wasn't the main thing that I was going to mention about it. He told a story, I think, of the war in Bosnia was going on at that time. And I've told you the story before. There was a minister that he was supposed to be meeting, and the minister didn't show up. The minister was like four hours late. And he says, I was really kind of upset with this minister. Because he said, I waited for four hours. I waited for four hours for this minister to show up. And when the guy showed up, he wasn't even apologetic. And the guy said that the reason he had come late was because he'd been watching the video. I mean, there's bombs going on outside, and Franklin's like, you're watching the video with all this stuff going on? And then the guy told him the story, and I told you this story before. He said that the guy was watching a video that some soldiers had made. These soldiers had captured a father, a son, and a daughter. And then he described what they did. They told the father to rape his daughter. And the father would not do it. And they shot and killed him. And they had it all on video. So they brought in the girl's brother and told him to rape his sister. And the girl, or the boy, saw what had happened to his father. And he decided to go ahead and do what they told him to do. And then they shot and killed the boy. And then they cut the little girl's legs off and watched her bleed to death. And we're like, oh, that is, that is horrendous. Why do you even tell that story, Pastor Tim? The shock guy? No, it wasn't that. That, that was shocking, but it was what Franklin Graham said right after that. And I think it's over in Jeremiah 17, 9. It says the heart of man is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? And I'm going to tell you something about yourself. You may think that you know who you are. You really have no idea what you're capable of doing. Tim, you make us out to be monsters. No, I'm just telling you. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is a record of human beings. And you and I think that we know ourselves let me tell you, God knows what you're capable of. And I tell you what, if it were not for the grace of God, you would be absolutely appalled at what you would be. And the good news about John 3.16 is that in spite of who we are, folks, God loves us. How much did he love us? He gave his only son. He only had one. And he said to his son, son, I've got a mission for you. I want you to go down there. Those people are going to perish without you and what you're willing to do for him. And his son must have said, you mean that they're going to do all of this and you want to go down and become like one of them? And God says, yes, because I love those wicked people so much. I want you to do that. What have I said before about the angels must have said when they found out that all of us humans were going to come up to, to heaven? Do you remember what I said? The angel said when they found out that all of us were coming, the angel <clears throat> said, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> in spite of all that we've ever done, folks, in spite of what we're capable of doing, the good news of the Bible is that God still loves us. And God was willing to allow his son. I doubt seriously that any of y'all would ever let one of your children go through what Jesus went through, but God did. And the only reason that he did it, I've heard it said this way, God would rather die than live without us. And he did. So don't ever forget the fact 
you are loved. When you end up feeling like nobody in this world loves you, the old song that I would sing, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'm going to eat a worm. Remember the song? I've sung it to you before. When you feel that way, be reminded of the cross. Be reminded of the manger here at Christmas. The fact is, God loves you, and nothing is ever going to change that. That leads me to the second passage of Scripture. What kind of a love is it? And we have a brief glimpse of what type of love it is from 1 Corinthians 13 today when we did our, our reading. But look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm not going to read the entire passage of Scripture. I'm just going to focus upon the fourth through the seventh verses and the first part of the eighth verse. But this is what type of love that God has. God's love is patient. How many of y'all get impatient with your spouse or your family member? You love them, but you do have a snapping point. I got a picture on my refrigerator at home with two rubber bands. You know, somebody's personified them. They're, they're like people. They're sitting on a sofa, you know, watching television. And the one rubber band says to the other rubber band, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have snapped at you. <laughs> you know what I can tell you, honestly? God's love is patient. He's never going to snap at you. He will always respond in love. God's love is patient. God's love is kind. Somebody has said about, they, they had interviewed an older person at, at a care facility, at a nursing home. And the older person in the, in the nursing home said, you know, when I was younger, I used to really admire people that were wealthy. I used to admire people that were talented. I used to admire all these people that were beautiful. I said, now that I'm an old person, I admire people that are kind. And I can tell you about the love that God has. God will always be kind. God is not harsh. It says that love does not envy. The only thing that God has or the only thing that you have that God wants is you. Why does God want you? Because God knows what you are going to do to yourself without Him. How many here would confess to making stupid decisions. How many of you folks, in the course of the next two weeks, when you're forced to eat, are going to indulge, and I'm going to make some dumb decisions? See, God understands that you and I are going to make a mess of our lives, and that's why God says, look, that's why I want you. I don't, I don't want anything else that you have. The only thing I want is you because I understand that if I don't get a hold of you, you're going to get a hold of yourself and what you do to yourself ain't going to be pretty. God's love is not envious. It's helpful. God's love does not boast. It's not that God just wants us to, to brag about him. God wants us to understand who his character is. He is awesome. He wants us to recognize that he is awesome. He can't change what he is. He is absolutely magnificent. God's love is not proud. God never waves it in our face that he's God. He just wants us to understand we are only here because of him. We were created by him, sustained by him. God is not rude. God is not self-seeking. Well, 
when I say self-seeking, he is seeking us to connect to him because we are not in without him. Thankfully, God is not easily angered. The next part I will say about his love. In this life, God is willing to forgive us of all of our wrongs. But I will say there will be a time that we will have to give an account if we're not ready. God does not, verse 6, God does not delight in evil, but he rejoices with the truth. God's purpose is to protect us, to develop a trust relationship with us, to inspire within us hope, and God will never, ever give up. He perseveres. God will never fail, but failure comes with us. This is the type of love that God wants to introduce into our lives, which leads you to the third point of today's passage of Scripture. Look with me back in the book of Romans, chapter 8. I'm trying to get through these, if I can, before the time runs out. Romans, chapter 8. Since we know the kind of love that God wants for us, God wants us to love Him. Look at Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to start at the 28th verse, and we're going to go down to the 39th verse. Romans 8, 28, we oftentimes will quote, you know, that all things work together for good. Don't we? Did you notice one little important phrase in there, though? We know that all things God works for the good those who love him. King James Version. We know that God works together in all things for those who love him. It may begs the question, if you and I don't love God, are all things working? We know the type of love that God has for us. The thing that I'm calling into question right now is what kind of love do we have for God? And I'm going to have more to say about that in the next passage of Scripture once we get through this. But I'm transitioning over from God's love for us, which we need God's love. But I'm transitioning over what about our love for God? In this passage of Scripture, I'm afraid a lot of people end up just saying, we know that all things work together. For good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose and you and I do need to love God and as I said we're going to get to another passage of scripture but here I want you to go on with me in the 29th verse for those God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son the predestination is that we might be made into the image of Jesus Christ let me say, as a pastor of this church, I do not believe in predestination in the sense that everything has already been determined by God. When you say that something is totally predestined, that removes any sort of choice. And if you don't have any choice, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. Am I right? It's almost like everything has been pre-programmed. And as I read the Bible from, from the beginning of the Bible to the end, We've got free choice. We're the ones that make the decision. So the predestination that he's talking about here is the predestined to be made in the image of Jesus. Those that become Christians, those that follow Jesus Christ, those that love Christ, God has predestined those people that love Christ to be made in the likeness, in the image of his Son. To be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. In the 30, 30th verse, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we respond? Shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, 
How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This love is permanent. It's lasting. What does he say? Who's going to separate us? Shall trouble? Hardship? Persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Danger? Sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Then the Apostle Paul answers this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There is a permanence of God's love. When bad things happen within your life, don't say, God doesn't love me anymore. God loves you. You know, could Job, if you go back to the story of Job, not in the Old Testament, God allowed Satan to come into Job's life. Satan came in and took all of Job's possessions, all of his oxen, all of his cattle, all of his sheep. God allowed Satan to come in and take all of Job's family. God allowed Satan to come in and take away Job's health. Job could have said, God just doesn't love me anymore. Not true. God still loved Job. God's eye was on Job. And we read at the end of Job's life that God restored everything. Some people say, well, how could you give back all the children that he lost? Somebody said, because everything else got doubled up. You know, he got twice as many sheep, he got twice as many camels, he got twice as many oxen. Somebody says, yeah, Job got twice as many children, but it says that he just got seven more. That's right. He had seven up in heaven, he had seven down here. He had twice as many as he had before. Why? Because God's love never stops. Hardship and trouble and persecution and famine and nakedness, all those things are not demonstrating whether or not God loves you. God loves you. And that's never going to change. I want to move to this other passage of Scripture. Um, John chapter 14. I'm just going to go to it. There's one from 1 John, but I'm just going to go to the one from John chapter 14. And I want to talk just a little bit more about our love for God. John chapter 14 I'm going to first start in the 15th verse, John chapter 14, verse 15. People oftentimes say, I love God. How do we prove that we love God? Well, you could say, I come to church, yeah. That may prove that you love God some. I give money, yeah. I say my prayers, yeah. Read the Bible. Jesus didn't list any of those things. What did Jesus say in the 15th verse? If you love me, you will obey what I command. The proof as to whether or not we love God is whether or not we're doing what he tells us to do. And if you and I are living in a state of disobedience and we just refuse to humble ourselves, you know what we're saying every time we do that? I don't love God. God wants us to love him because without him, we don't have anything. Look with me down at the 23rd verse. Again, the 14th chapter, 23rd verse. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. I see you smiling over there, Chuck. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words that you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So as we contemplate love, when we celebrate the love that God for us, the fact that God loves us, I love the fact that God loves me. I love the, the, the 
many ways that God shows his love as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 13. I love what it says in Romans chapter 8 that nothing is ever going to separate me from that love. But the question that I now need to ask is how much do I love God? And it's not just saying that I love God. If you and I are not backing it up by doing what he tells us to do, we're saying every time that we're disobedient, God, I don't love you. That's a very dangerous thing. One final passage of scripture. Y'all are going to say, man, oh man, you're going to wear the cover out on the Bible. <coughs> this, this last passage of scripture comes from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. This is the reward of love. Whenever we love as we should, there is a great reward coming. Second Timothy chapter 4. I'll give you just a little bit of a extra comment about this. Today is the 18th of December. Do any of you folks know what happened last year on this day? I do. My younger brother went home to be with the Lord. Guess what passage of scripture was the devotional reading for that day from our daily bread? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, particularly verse 7. But the Apostle Paul had reached the end of his life. And anybody that knows the Apostle Paul knows that he, he, he relished the love that God had for him. The Apostle Paul didn't feel worthy to have been called to the ministry. In fact, the Apostle Paul considered himself the worst of sinners. One of the reasons he considered himself the worst of sinners is because he even uh, agreed to the death of, of Stephen. You know, when Stephen was stoned to death and he persecuted Christians and he was absolutely blown away. That God could forgive him. Not only forgive him for all of those awful things that he'd done. But he was amazed that God could use him in the ministry. It's just like similar to the, the writer John Newton that wrote Amazing Grace. John Newton was blown away that God's grace could forgive him for all of the lives that he had ruined. John Newton was a slave trader. And he had ruined lots of lives. Both of those men were just absolutely blown away that God's love could sustain them. The Apostle Paul loved God with all of his heart and he says I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure he knows that his time is up and he says this is the verse of scripture because I took a screenshot on my, on my phone last year on the 18th when my brother passed away I have fought the good fight I have finished the race I have kept the faith so now he's going to say, because you have loved God and you have served God, this is the reward. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Those of us that love God, Jesus, we look forward to the day that we see Jesus. One of the songs we've got in our white hymnal, we don't sing it very often, but the song is, My Savior, first of all. When my life's work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, uh, I can't remember how the rest of the words, I'd have to get the book out, but it says, I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. But the main purpose of writing that song is that you and I, what we look forward to more than anything is the love that we're going to experience when we're finally able to see the one in person who gave himself for us. I pray that you and I might remember, be reminded of these passages, these great love passages from out of the word of God. Know that God loves us. Yes, I, I, I want everybody to know that God loves them. But I want to say also, it's equally important for us to love God. It's those that love God that Jesus is really looking forward to seeing us just as much 
as we're looking forward to seeing him. I know that he's with us. I know that he's with us every day. But I'm talking about in a very real way. Can you imagine what it's like to go up and throw your arms around the one who gave us all so that you could be him? What a day of rejoicing that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Do you know the love of God in your heart? Not just his love for you, but do you love him with your heart? Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much for your love. Every day we wake up and we see expressions of your love. When the sun rises, when we look at the blue sky, when we look at this earth that you've created, we see it. At Christmas time, we really see your love expressed in a manger scene. Father, we know that you love us. And I guess the question that I have today is that do we love you the way we should? And I just pray, Father, that you might help us to remember this Christmas that we do want your love and we need your love, but we need to love you more. May you help us, Father, in our quest to grow more connected to you because we recognize without you we are nothing. As we have an opportunity to sing an invitation to him, if there are decisions that we need to make at this time, help us to make these decisions that you might be loved more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, stand and turn to page 483. <laughs> Closing prayer. Sure, would you lead us a closing prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for.